today in our, our Be Rich campaign, we're, we're going to talk to you about how today uh, God calls us to love without limits if you're a follower of Jesus. And we as a church want to be known as a church that loves without limits. We don't love people only if they vote like we do. We don't love people only if they look like we do. We don't share the gospel with people only if they meet certain criteria for us. Here at Fort Caroline Baptist Church, we believe that the gospel is for everyone or it's for no one. And we want to love without limits and tell everyone about the Lord Jesus Christ and call them to faith in him and to follow him as their personal Lord and Savior. As a part of this Be Rich campaign, we have been unleashing the love of God and the generosity of you in our community. Last week, you gave money, and you can still give money if you'd like to, to help fight human trafficking in our own community through a local nonprofit called Her Song. Go to our website, fcbc.life, and you can learn more about that. And today, as you can see on the stage, and as you came in today, and maybe in some of the hallways, there are many toys for Christmas that you have donated, and every single one of these toys will be going to the boys and girls here in Jacksonville at the Florida Baptist Children's Home. And you say, well, I'm just now learning about this. I want to get involved in it. You can. There again, go to our website, fcbc.life forward slash be rich, and you can see the list of toys that we're asking you to bring. You don't even have to wrap them. Isn't that awesome? If you've ever seen me wrap a gift, you will be grateful that I don't have to wrap a gift. Uh, so just bring them unwrapped this week, donate them, drop them off here at the office, and we'd be happy to make sure they get added to this list. And we're going to bless boys and girls. And then next week, we're going to challenge you to bring food items to help our local food pantry. It is called Arlington Community Services, and it is a local nonprofit that feeds hungry people and families right here in our community. Our church for its history has been a part of this pantry, this food pantry. They also provide assistance at times with finances if people have an electric bill that they're behind on or something like that, but primarily it's food. And Arlington Community Services has told us what they need for this Thanksgiving season. And we said we will share that with our congregation and we'll ask them to donate food so that we can bless hundreds of families in our community this Thanksgiving season. So there again, learn about that. Go shopping this week and bring your food items to church next Sunday. And we'll have receptacles around for you to deposit those in. And then why do we do this? And this is not new to our church. We do this all all throughout the year. Your generosity, your, your helping people in need happens all throughout the year. Why do we do this? Well, we do it because we believe our love should be without limits. And I want to take you to a New Testament book called the book of James, James chapter 2. Uh, this is actually not so much a book as it is a letter. Uh, it's a letter penned by the half-brother of Jesus. And you say, why do you call him the half-brother of Jesus? Because if you're virgin-born, all your other siblings are half-brothers or sisters. And James was the half-brother of Jesus. James grew up with Jesus. In fact, James at first did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And can you blame him? I mean, what would it take for your brother to convince you he's the Son of God? Well, nothing short of a death, burial, and resurrection from the dead and a physically appearing to your brother alive. That's the only thing that would convince you that your brother is the Son of God. And that is exactly what happened to James. All throughout his life, all throughout the public ministry of Jesus, he did not believe Jesus was the Savior. But after the cross of Calvary, we see a radical transformation in James's life where he lives the rest of his life and dies telling people, Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And I call you to put your faith and your confidence in him. What could account for that transformation of James's life? The resurrection of Jesus where Jesus appeared to him physically alive. And maybe you're a little skeptical about the Christian faith. I understand that. Even the first followers of Jesus did not believe he was going to rise from that grave. But you owe it to yourself to answer that question 
How do you account for the life of James being transformed from an unbeliever to a believer in his brother Jesus being the Son of God, the Savior of the world? The only reasonable explanation and the evidence of James's own testimony is it's the resurrection of Jesus that changed his life. And so our faith is not based on hope and fables and myth. The Christian faith is based on the eyewitness testimony of people who lived and saw Jesus die and who saw him rise from the dead. And we have one of the letters that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote to Christians in the first century. And he's writing to Christians who gather together in local assemblies. We would call them churches. And this is what he had to say in James chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That's how James describes his brother. He says, our Lord Jesus Christ, yours and mine. He is also my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he is the Lord of glory. In other words, Jesus is the manifestation of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all the universe. That's who James is writing about. And he says, we all know this as followers of Jesus. This is our confession of faith, that he is our Lord he is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And James says, that's awesome. But do not hold that faith in Jesus with partiality towards other people. He's saying the gospel of Jesus is for everyone. Or it's for no one. Now, grammatically, James is giving a prohibition of an activity that's already being practiced. Evidently, there were some in the first century church that James was aware of who were sharing the gospel with certain people but not sharing it with other people. They were telling certain kinds of people about Jesus but other people they looked down on and didn't care enough about them to tell them about Jesus. In fact, the word partiality that James uses here means according to the face. That's what the Greek word means. It means to judge someone according to the face. And James says, my brothers, don't judge people according to the face as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. There's no room for favoritism in the family of God. Now that was a huge statement and problem in the first century. The first century ruled by Rome divided itself up in categories of race or rank or religion, or resources. And depending on where you were in the hierarchy, you were either esteemed or you were basically uh, despised. Or if you were in the middle, just ignored until you were needed. And James saw that spirit of partiality and favoritism and division and labeling creeping into the nascent church. And he says, stop doing it. That's how the world lives. That is not how the followers of Jesus ought to live. And then he starts telling us how this sometimes plays itself out in the church. Look at verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, so he's painting this picture of two people, and he's contrasting these two people. First of all, a man walks in, and by his very appearance, he appears to be a man of means. He is wearing a resplendent robe, a toga. In that first century, it would have been the attire of someone higher up in the social status of the community, someone with wealth and prestige. And just in case you missed the, the clues that this is a rich person, he also has a gold ring on his finger. Sometimes people wore gold rings because they possessed those rings and it showed off their prosperity. Sometimes, though, rich people could rent a ring 
for special occasions to make themselves look more wealthy than they really were. By the way, many of the people in Hollywood that you see walking that red carpet, they're renting those clothes and those jewels uh, to make themselves look better than maybe what they would otherwise. And James says, so here's one person that walks into your church service and everybody starts whispering, look who's here, look who's here. He says, but then there's another man that walks in He is poor. Literally, the word in the Greek means destitute. He is bankrupt. He is poor, and his clothing is shabby. It's dirty. It's defiled. And rather than saying, look who's here, you start whispering, what's he doing here? He continues in verse 3. And if you pay attention... This means to give special attention to, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. We've got the seat of honor for you. You come right down front. We're so happy to have you. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Basically, stand over there, get out of the way. Or sit at my feet. We don't have a special seat of honor for you. Just sit at my feet and be unseen and be quiet. If that's how you treat people, James says, you are showing favoritism. Verse 4, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The problem is not that you noticed That this is a person of means and this is a person without means. That's not the problem. The problem is how you treated one versus how you treated the other. You gave special attention to the rich man as if he is better and holier and more loved than the poor man. You have shown favoritism. You've made distinctions among yourselves. Who's in and who's out. And you've become judges. You're judging a book by its cover. And you have evil thoughts. Because your thoughts are what guided your actions. And your thoughts that we can curry favor with the rich person and we can despise without repercussion the poor person shows how evil your thoughts are. You are using people for what you can get out of them rather than loving people indiscriminately and sharing the gospel of Jesus. He's reminding us what we need to be reminded in the 21st century, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You don't have a leg up on anybody else because you've got more of this world's stuff. When it comes to our spiritual condition without Jesus, we are all spiritually bankrupt. We are all paupers. We are all destitute and have nothing to offer God that would merit one moment in heaven and one moment out of hell. No, everything we have from God is because God has been gracious to us. And it takes the same grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to save a rich person or a poor person, a Republican or a Democrat, a black person or a white person, an American or a Haitian. And the reason that James is going to the lengths he is to say stop doing this is because impartiality is actually one of the characteristics of God himself. We, we love to study the characteristics and the, the, the attributes of God. We, we, you know, especially people that like to get into theology. Oh, God is omnipotent, which means all-powerful. And I'm grateful that He is because when I am weak, He is strong. Oh, God is omnipresent. That means He is present everywhere at all times. And thank God He is because whenever I am lonely... God is always there. He is omniscient, which means He knows all things. And I'm thankful that He is because when I'm confused and I don't know which way to turn, I can turn to God who gives wisdom and direction and guidance. But that same God who is all of that and so much more is also impartial when it comes to His love. And His grace. 
Only four times in the New Testament is this word partiality or impartial used in the New Testament. This is one time here in James. The other three times, they always refer to God or the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, Romans chapter 2, verse 11, there is no partiality with God. Luke chapter 20, verse 21, the Pharisees had to admit to Jesus, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach the truth, and there is no partiality with you. You love everyone and treat everyone the same. And why should we not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality? Why should we not do that? It is because it is a reflection of our God who loved without limits. And His love did not exclude you. His love included you. When others counted you out, when others gave up on you, when others judged you by your appearance, when others judged you by your past mistakes, God says, I love you anyway. And aren't you grateful He did? And we are to love without distinction. Maybe we need to go back and learn that song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, for they are precious in His sight. If God looks upon educational status, He looks at the Rhodes Scholar the same as He looks at a high school dropout. If He looks at racial status, He looks at a black man the same way He looks at a white man. If God looks on social standing, He looks at the President of the United States of America in the same way He looks at a peasant who is just trying to find a new life and a new home. He doesn't look with distinction. He loves with impartiality. And as His followers, we are to love just like Him. James continues here. And for sake of time, we've got to hurry. You guys are not listening fast enough. So he writes in verse 5, he writes, Listen, my beloved brothers, has, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him? James is not saying that God only elects the poor to salvation and that only the poor will be saved or all poor people will be saved. What James is pointing out, though, is what history has demonstrated that the receptivity to the gospel of Jesus has been primarily in the people who see their desperate need for Jesus. So often, the more people have of the things of this world, the less they think they need God. And James says, don't you understand God's chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him. That's why I love Fort Caroline Baptist Church, that every person is welcome here. All people of all skin colors, of all backgrounds are welcome here at Fort Caroline. We're going to be a church for the masses, not for the classes. If you're looking to impress people with your religious pedigree, you're in the wrong church. This church says all are welcome, all are loved by Jesus, and all need Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And we call all people to put their confidence in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? James is writing about specifics that we don't know anything about. We don't have any other details here. But evidently, these Christians were currying favor with rich people. And what did they get in return from these rich people who were not Christians? They got used. They got drug into court. It didn't work. You can be nice to them, but whenever they are done with you, they're done with you. Verse 7, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? There again, James is not saying this is how all rich people are and rich people are evil. No, he's saying these people in this situation in the first century in that local context were these kind of people who were blaspheming the name of Jesus, the very name that these Christians professed to love. And then he writes this verse, and this will be our last verse. If you really fulfill the royal law, 
according to the Scripture. And then he quotes it. Here's the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. The brother of Jesus says, let's just, let's just boil it all down to this. If you really fulfill the royal law, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you're no longer showing distinction and favoritism. You are no longer becoming judges of people based on their outward appearance. You are no longer evil in your thoughts. No, if you will love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. You can sleep with a clear conscience at night because love is dictating how you treat other people. Why does he call this the royal law? Some say, well, it's the royal law because this is the law that ennobles a man. It makes us bigger and better when we learn to love our neighbors. Others say, well, this is the royal law because this is the supreme law. And this is the, the number one law. Remember, Jesus was asked, what was the greatest commandment in all the Scriptures? And He said, the first is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But I believe it's the royal law because of whom James claims to be the King of kings and the Lord of all lords, none other than Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And the royal law, the law that issues forth from our king, who's not a Republican, who's not a Democrat, who's not an Independent, he's not even an American. The law that our king issues to us is love your neighbor as yourself. Love other people like you love yourself. Treat other people like you treat yourself. Give other people the deference that you want other people to give to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's why this is the royal law, because it was issued forth from the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, who is never up for an election. He, see, he is seated on the throne of glory forever and ever. But this is not only the royal law because it comes from Jesus. It's the royal law because it was embodied by Jesus. This is how he loves. He loves everyone. Everyone without limits. When I was a kid, I remember watching my sister in our backyard in Valdosta, Georgia. And she had plucked a flower from our backyard flower bed and she was pulling its petals off. And you know probably what she was saying as she pulled one petal at a time. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. It was the first time I'd ever heard that. I found out later she was divining the intentions of a boy at school. Does he love me or not? And if you get to the last petal that you pluck from the flower and it's on he loves me not, you have your answer. But I think my sister may have rigged it. I'm not sure. But it ended on, he loves me. Well, I don't care who you are today, watching or listening or sitting in this service. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your economic status is. I don't care what any other distinction that may set you apart from other people. You do not have to question, does he love me? Or does he love me not? He loves you. Period, point blank, without limits, without distinction. He loves you. And as his followers, we love you too. Maybe we've not always gotten this right as a church, or maybe we haven't always gotten this perfectly as individual Christians. And if maybe you're saying, I've been hurt by people who've not loved me, you need to understand loving is not always the same as agreeing. You don't always agree with me and what I believe. I don't always agree with you and how you believe. But that doesn't mean we can't love each other. So in those moments where we've not always gotten it right, we ask for your forgiveness. But we as a church are going to be a church that's known for being like Jesus. We're going to love without limits. We're not going to compromise our faith. We're not going to compromise our convictions. We're not going to compromise what Jesus, our Lord, the Lord of glory, teaches us to obey but even as we hold our faith in Him, we're going to hold open our hearts to everyone. 
We're going to be like Jesus. We're going to love without limits. Here's your homework this week. In a nation that is divided over so many distinctions, I want you to ask, what am I doing to be a part of the solution? How can I be who I am and what I believe, but how can I also remember at the end of the day, what does love require of me? And that's the question I want you to mull in your mind this week. What does love require of me? And go and love somebody without limits. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the stillness of this moment, I thank you for this church. And I thank you that I haven't had to write a letter to this church like James had to write to that first century church. But God, we're not perfect, and we need the reminder, especially in these days of, of tension that we have felt in this year and over the last many years. And Father, we pray that you would help us in the midst of that to be a part of the solution, not to further the problem. And one of the ways that we can be a part of the solution is by loving without limits. God, whenever we look at someone else, whatever distinction there may be between them and us, help us to see a person who is the object of your love for whom Jesus died on a bloody cross for. And if he could love them, even if they don't love him back, even if they mistreated him and slapped him in the face and plucked out his beard and placed a crown of thorns upon his brow and blasphemed his holy name and rejoiced when he died, if he could still love without limits. May you, by your grace, help us to love without limits. And God, I'm going to confess, I can't do this on my own. None of us can do this on our own. But Jesus living in us, through his power, through his strength, through his example, can help us to do this. And so, Heavenly Father, have your perfect will and way in our lives as we learn to love like Jesus. Because we believe the gospel is for everyone or it's for no one. And we want to love everyone, everywhere, every day. Help us to do that. God will give you the praise for the difference you make in our lives and our Christian witness as we learn to love without limits. While your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed, dear friend, today do you need Jesus as your Savior? Trust Him today. Trust Him based on the fact of His death, burial, and resurrection for you. And like the brother of Jesus, James, put your confidence in Jesus Christ and leave this place today saying, He is my Lord. He is my Savior because today I've committed my life to Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for saving those from their sin and the penalty of their sin who believe in Jesus and Jesus alone. It's in His name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let us know what your next step is in your spiritual journey. Take care. Thank you.